Hey, what's up, nerds? Paul here at Radio Free Hammer Hall, and today is the big day. Today, between all of various different sources that we have around the internet, we basically have the entire Cities of Sigmar book at our fingertips somewhere. So I've cobbled together things from various different sources. Um, there were a couple of videos from channels that got the book in advance for Games Workshop, and they were kind enough to basically read the rules to us in those videos. Always good. I took lots of notes. On Games Workshop's website, all of the uh, War Scroll downloads for each of the kits has been updated to the new Cities of Sigmar War Scroll, and there is also a document floating around um, the internet that has all of the points values as well as battle line if and all of those things. So, that said, I've got basically everything here. What I'm going to do is hit on the big stuff. I want to go through the cities and the city battalions and kind of get a feel for what does this city do? And also talk about, in that context, what some of the different factions and war scrolls individually kind of fit into that. I don't want to go through and read all the war scrolls. I don't want to go through and give you a list of all the points. You can go on Games Workshop's website and look at all the war scrolls right now. And I'm sure very soon the app is going to be updated anyway. And all of the points will be available very soon. Um... The battle line if thing is incredibly complicated. Um, there's only a handful of units that are generic battle line all the time. And there's a bazillion units. There's like battle line if this is your general. Battle line if this is your city. Like it, it just is a lot. And I don't want to overwhelm people with that. I'm not sure that's really pertinent to a preview or review of the book. So I'm going to stick with hitting the high points and where things kind of all fit together, how this book works, what things are going to look like. First, let's take a look at the status of rumors and what turned out to be true and what turned out to be not true. So on the true side, yes, steam tanks can be battle line. Steam tanks can also now be a hero option, uh, similar to our Celestial Hurricanum and Luminarch of Heish War Scrolls. We get a version with a hero and a version without a hero. It's on the same War Scroll, it's just if hero then add these abilities. So that's pretty cool. Our command abilities and spells, all of that, that is by city and not by race or faction. So everything, they went really, really hard on making this book more about the cities than the individual factions. It's city first and then what you fill it in with. Things that turned out to be false... Uh, we don't have a Demigriff hero. We don't get to keep our Allegiance abilities from the old factions. Uh, dwarves do not have two wounds. We did not get a terrain piece. So, whew, uh, that's quite a bit of stuff already right off the rip. So let's get into what the actual command abilities and all of that are here. Now, I just want to give you a caveat here. I do not actually have the book in front of me. I took all of this information from various different sources, uh, taking copious notes while listening to videos on other channels that were reviewing the book, really more or less just reading the book. I gotta be honest. Don't wanna call anybody out, but you guys are basically just reading the book. I'm not going to do that to you. We're going to talk about the book. That said, 
uh, some of the exact wording on these abilities may be off. So I'm going to be talking about certain things in more general terms. Uh, I didn't take down, for example, like the names of abilities. Uh, or artifacts, or command traits, any of those sorts of things. And with some things, there's going to be a difference between within and wholly within. Uh, a lot of those wholly within versus within things, I did not catch the difference in my notes. Uh, I just made a huge spreadsheet of all of this stuff, taking it down as quickly as I could, and listening to things on like 0.75 speed so that I can actually take it all down with people talking fast which i'm going to try to also not do to you guys so let's get started with what is in this book we already had confirmed all of the factions that are in here our free guild our dispossessed our iron weld arsenal our uh wanderers are, uh, I'm forgetting the rest, Order Serpentist, Order Draconis, Phoenix Temple, uh, Darkling Covens, etc. Et All of the stuff that we've already talked about is in here. Um, we got our specific note on how Stormcast are included in this book. They basically, you can take Stormcast units and they will work just like anything else in the book they get the cities of sigmar keyword they get the city specific keyword whichever one you choose the only thing is that you can only take one in four of your units as stormcast otherwise everything about stormcast it works just like any other faction that's sitting in this book we also have two other cities that will allow us to take additional outside factions and i'm going to review this again when we get to them but the living city lets you also take sylvaneth with the same rule that it's one in four and tempest's eye lets you take caradron overlords again with the same rule of one in four units so that means that in these you can take one in four of your units as stormcast one in four of your units as say sylvaneth or caradron overlords in the appropriate city one in four as an ally and one in four as stuff from the cities so you can have some really mixed up armies here there is a lot of it's not quite a pure mixed order sort of book but you can definitely get really close to what mixed order would be in this book that said, our allies. Uh, we can take Daughters of Cain, Fire Slayers, Caradron Overlords, except when you're in Tempest Eye, because they're already part of the army. I didn't have Deepkin and Sylvaneth, except when you are Living City, because you can use it in Living City, and except when you're in Greywater Fastness, because fluff reasons. All right, so that's the basics of what stuff can be included in your army. So on to our, our allegiance abilities. We have three allegiance abilities in addition to using Stormcast for army-wide regardless of what city you're in. First, your general can take a retinue troop. So you get one unit. Uh, uh, 5 to 20 models with one wound each. And this is only for a general with a wounds characteristic of 6 or less. If they're within 3 inches of your general, whenever your general would take a wound, you roll a d6. On a 4-up, that wound is instead allocated to the retinue unit. So, it kind of is a little bit like the old 8th edition lookout sir rule where you roll and the unit might just take the hit instead of your general number two we get sort of like a lieutenant it's called the adjutant 
and they are sort of the second in command to your general. When they're within three inches of your general in your hero phase, you roll a d6. On a four up, you get an extra command point. And the only caveat to this is that both the adjutant and your general have to be six wounds or less. And then our final ability is related to endless spells. All endless spells cast by Cities of Sigmar Wizards are treated as though they were cast in their home realm. So, for example, Purple Sun will always be treated as though it is in the realm of death. So it gets whatever extra bonus it is. And that applies to all endless spells that you cast that have that on their war scroll. If they are getting a benefit for being in a specific realm, you always get that benefit. So those are our general abilities. Everything else falls into the seven cities that we have here. One of the interesting things about these cities is that they are all based out of two different realms. They're all either in the realm of life or the realm of fire. And when you are building your list, your city will also dictate what realm your army is from. The kind of exception-ish to that here is Hammer Hall, because those that are familiar with the fluff, Hammer Hall is on two sides of a realm gate. So half of the city is in the realm of life, half of the city is in the realm of fire. So you can be life or fire when you're in Hammer Hall. All of the others are either in life or fire. That means primarily it's going to limit which realm artifacts you can take. There's not a ton of realm artifacts that people really use to begin with, and a lot of the artifacts in this book are really good. That said, we only get three artifacts per city, so we might want to dip into those realm artifacts more often when we're taking a battalion. So, what do we get with each of our cities? It dictates what realm we're in. We're going to get various battle traits. Each one has a couple of different battle traits. Each city has a unique command ability that all of your heroes can use. Each city has three command traits and three artifacts. Uh, each city has a spell lore with three spells, uh, except for Hollow Heart, which has six, because that is the magic-oriented realm. And then we get a War Scroll Battalion that only that city can use. So there are seven battalions in the book, and there's just one for each city. And you can't take, for example, the Hammer Hall Battalion in Tempest's Eye. You have to use the Hammer Hall Battalion in Hammer Hall. Use the Tempest's Eye Battalion in Tempest's Eye. Fairly simple, straightforward. Some of them are really good. Some of them are meh. A couple of them are bad. Just going to say that up front. Along with all of this, by the way. But most of this, I have to say, I am very happy with how this came out. So the seven cities all sort of play to a different feeling. Each of these cities is going to play like you are using a completely different book. And playing each of these cities with a different focus of factions is also going to feel like a completely different book. <coughs> Excuse me. So... With that, let's get started with Hammer Hall. Realm of Life or Realm of Fire. For our battle traits, number one is a battle trait called Banners Held High. What this does is you count your units in your hero phase that have battle standards. And 
for each unit with a standard, you roll a d6. On a 6, you get a command point. That is potentially a lot of command points. <laughs> um, you can definitely build around MSU-style armies, have a ton of banners around, and get all the command points. You also get an additional command point if Aventus Firestrike is in your army. Not sure if anybody would actually do that, but it's an option. In addition, while your troops are wholly within your own territory, they don't take battle shock tests. So that's kind of a big deal. Um, when I was initially looking at War Scrolls, I noticed that all of the banners, they all got changed to plus one bravery. So all of our free guild, for example, that used to ignore battle shock on a one, they no longer have that. Now they're just plus one bravery. And our dwarves, for example, used to have a command ability, or I'm sorry, not a command ability, a battle trait that half the time just ignored battle shock. So it, it was when I was initially looking at the war scrolls, when they first came up last night, uh, whatever it was like 12.01 AM New Zealand time, I was furiously going through the GW New Zealand website, looking at war scrolls. Um, I initially sort of had this concern that we would have a battle shock problem with a lot of these armies. Because really, a lot of them are big armies. Like, they use high model count. They're going to be taking a lot, a lot of guys off the board. So battle shock's going to be an issue. What's good, I will say up front, is most of the cities have some really strong battle shock immunity abilities. Or battle shock reduction abilities. This is probably the strongest one, where all of your troops that are wholly within your territory don't take battle shock. Like that's really good. So that that immediately between the CP farm and no battle shock in your territory, Hammer Hall immediately stands out to me as just an all around strong city. Our command ability for Hammer Hall is selecting one unit that's in enemy territory, wholly within enemy territory. At the end of the combat phase, you can activate the command ability to make that unit fight again. Now, you can't do it more than once per unit, but you can activate more than one unit if you have, say, a whole bunch of command points when you rolled a pile of D6s at the beginning of your turn. So it really gives you this interesting opportunity with like the activation wars thing going on that how is Hammer Hall playing in the activation wars? Well, you get to just fight twice if you're in enemy territory. You're not necessarily going first, but man, are you going to hit back hard. So, command traits for Hammer Hall. We get plus one attack and an extra command point at the start of the game. Uh, a 12 inch bubble around our general that re rolls wounds of one. And a 12 inch bubble around your general that's plus one to hit if your general charged that turn out of that i would have to say the one that's giving you one extra attack on a melee weapon and an extra cp that's really good um just an artifact that gives you a command point is outstanding and it's also you know it, it, giving you extra attacks on your general so our artifacts we have one that's just a flat plus one to save. Uh, we have one that improves the Ren characteristic of one melee weapon by one and improves it by an additional one damage when we're within six inches of an objective. And then we have an interesting split artifact. When we're in the Realm of Fire, this artifact is a 
12 inch plus one to hit in melee bubble. And in the realm of life, in your hero phase, we have healing of D3 on a roll of a four plus for everyone within 12 inches of your general. So each unit within 12 inches of your general, you roll a D6 on a four up, it heals D3 wounds. Also very strong. All three of these are really good. Um, I don't know which one I would necessarily pick. It would be situational. So then we have three additional spells. Uh, the first casts on a six and the unit gets plus one to run in charge and it flies until the next hero phase. The next casts on a seven and a unit within nine inches of the caster is minus one for your enemy to hit. So you pick a unit and anything attacking it is minus one to hit that turn. Then we have uh, another one that goes off on a seven. Uh, one enemy unit within 18 inches gets D3 mortal wounds. If it has 10 or more models, it gets D6 mortal wounds. Also very strong. So our battalion is a free guild general and three to six units of demigriff knights. And what this does is it gives us plus one to hit and plus one to wound for units that charge within 18 inches of the general on Griffin in the battalion. So plus one to hit and plus one to wound on the Griffin himself and plus one to hit and wound on the demigriffs. Now demigriffs are also much better now in this book. Their lances uh, are four, three to hit rather than four to hit. They no longer get plus one to wound when they charge. They still keep their plus one damage when they charge. And now, in addition, they are rend two when they charge with their lances. So they're really good. They got their points ratcheted up to match that. But I think we're going to see this battalion a lot. I have already put in my order for more demigriffs. I'm a big fan. Um, this, in general, I think is very strong. Our uh, Another army-wide note is all of our musicians have all been standardized to be plus one to run in charge. So our demigriffs are all going to be charging on plus one. They are going to be able to benefit from the general on Griffin's command ability, which gives them plus one to charge and hit. Then we have a spell that goes off on a six that can give them plus one to charge and fly. And on our battle mage, we have another spell that can give a unit plus one to charge. So they are potentially charging really far <laughs> um these guys can land really long charges so i really like that a lot and with all the command points that this army is going to be able to generate you can definitely be re-rolling those charges pretty easily so they are really good i like it a lot in general, I think this is going to be kind of like your default city. I feel like this is good with pretty much all of the different factions. With the battalion, it definitely leans towards being better with Free Guild as opposed to some of the others. But all of these, you know, getting lots of command points is good for any of these factions. So that's definitely just a really strong starting point and i think we're going to see a lot of hammer hall armies next up is the living city which is in the realm of life and this is one of our cities that can take another outside faction so you can include 
Sylvaneth units as uh, one in four of the units in this army. Our battle traits, uh, we heal one wound uh, to all of our units each hero phase. And we have the Hidden Paths ability, which lets us ambush up to half our army. So we can set them aside uh, during setup. And then during any movement phase, we can set them up within six inches of the edge of the battlefield and nine inches away from enemy units and go from there. So we get um, kind of like a deep striking ambushing ability. Has to be along the board edges, but I can tell you from experience playing other armies that have that ability, that's not an issue. And it's also important to note here with this that almost all of our units have plus one to charge. So although you're nine inches away, you have at worst an eight inch charge with virtually everything. Now, our command ability is really interesting. You use it during the shooting phase and after a unit shoots, you can have it make a normal move. Now the fluff of this is that, you know, you shoot and run away. The thing is, is it doesn't tell you where you can go. So you can shoot and then move towards the enemy and then charge them. That's definitely not bad at all. Uh, for some units, that's going to let you like go double move. In the case of things that are going to be using the hidden paths, you can set them up nine inches away from the enemy. And then if they have a shooting attack that's more than nine inches, they make a shot and then they move. Because our wording is at the end of the movement phase, you do this setup. Not you set it up and then it can't move this turn. So what we're able to do is use this command ability to sneak these guys up. That said, there's not too many units that are really strong in melee that I would want to be using this with um, in terms of like getting aggressive with them. What can be good is taking something that has a shooting attack and is cheap and throwing them towards your opponent as like a really close screen or to just use them as a screen in general, move them around so that they're just kind of in the way. Shadow Warriors, for example, are a great uh, one to do with this. You can pop them up nine inches away from the enemy. They have a good shooting attack. Then they can use this command ability and make a move. Now, in some situations, you can just pop them up right in front of your enemy lines and say then move them up to just three inches away from you know your en enemy's like big hammer unit now they have to kind of charge through your unit first and kind of bind them up a turn so that's definitely a very good uh command ability i really like that i think the living city is going to be one of the the city is that is just like full of weird tricks that you can pull uh, specifically with hidden paths and this command ability and a few of the other things that we have here. So for command traits, uh, our first is plus one to save and plus one to wound. That is very good. Uh, our next one, the general can run in charge. That is also very good. And then our last one is, if our general is a wizard, they know all of the spells from the spell lore. If they are not a wizard, they know they become a wizard and can cast one spell from the spell lore. For our artifacts, we have one that's really strong. Again, this is playing with the activation wars. Our artifact 
improves the Ren characteristic of one of our melee weapons by one. And that hero will fight first during the uh, combat phase if they charge that turn. So that is super good. Anytime you have that fight before everybody else ability, that can be really good. We can compound that, again, make that your general, give it the command trait that is plus one to save and plus one to wound. Now they're getting in there and they're hitting harder. You can also use the run and charge. That will get them in there faster if they're a little bit slower moving or if you just want to guarantee that turn one alpha strike. Our next artifact, uh, if it's six or fewer wounds and the hero is in cover, it cannot be hit with missile weapons at all. Uh, if it has seven or more wounds, it's minus one to hit in cover. And our last artifact is once per game, it gives an extra attack to all of your Sylvaneth. And I did not catch what the radius is around the hero when you pop that, but that could be really strong. For our spells, uh, our first one casts on a 6, and it just heals d6 to a unit within 18 inches of the caster. Our second one goes off on a 7. You pick an enemy unit within 18 inches, and uh, it halves its movement until your next hero phase. And the first time it moves until your next hero phase, it will take d6 mortal wounds. And finally, casting on a 6, a, a friendly unit within 18 inches um, is minus 1 to be wounded. So you, you select that unit, enemy units are minus 1 to, to wound against that unit. Our battalion for this one is a Nomad Prince, three units of Wildwood Rangers, and zero to three units of Wild Riders. And it gives them plus one to charge when they're using the Hidden Paths Ambush ability. So that's really good. <laughs> Let's just set up the scenario for a moment. These guys are already plus one to charge. So the battalion is now giving them plus two to charge. You're setting them up nine inches away from the enemy. So that means it's a charge on a seven. A nomad prince is also included in this battalion. And you can just set up you know, your heroes in the hidden paths as well as regular units. So you have a very good chance that these guys are going to be standing right next to a hero. So then they can use your generic command ability to re-roll charges. A re-rollable seven inch charge is very easy to make. And wild riders on the charge have rend two, two damage. They're really good. Wildwood Rangers also just solid melee troops. So this battalion really makes living city like tilt towards using your wanderers but even with that i can see applications of all of the various different factions in here because this is just a, a really strong set of abilities being able to ambush like any of your units that's really good and our spells are solid our artifacts and command traits are really good. We have some shenanigans with moving and shooting. There's a lot of interesting stuff here in Living City. I think this is going to be one that is going to have people scour through the War Scrolls, come up with weird things that work well, and do some really mean tricks. Like, I really think that's where this is at. I think this is probably going to be a very, like, alpha strikey aggressive army 
that's just coming in at uh, out of the board edges and going to be all over your opponent very quickly. Um, and there's uh, definitely incentive in here to use multi wound models because you are all of your models are all sorry all of your units are healing a wound every hero phase, so that's you know going to lend itself to a lot of monsters, a lot of cavalry, a lot of heroes. Definitely like this one a lot. In fact, I've got to say, like, I like most of these a lot. But on we go. Our next is Greywater Fastness, which I am sure is going to get the award for least fun to play against City. This is just gunline the City. So we are in the Realm of Life. Our battle traits. Um, if you take a Rune Lord, it has an additional prayer that it can take. On a two up, one of your war machines near it gets plus one to hit until your next hero phase. All of your Iron Weld Arsenal artillery get an extra three inches to their shooting. And during your first shooting phase, they all get to shoot twice. I think you can already see, Gunline the Army is going to be really unfun to play against. They did ratchet down the power of the Hellstorm Rocket Battery. But we did get combined... Uh, crew profiles on our artillery pieces now so we don't have to worry about our artillery crew getting sniped out and making the artillery useless now they're just sort of extra models to stand there and look pretty so our command ability for gray water fastness one unit of hand gunners or one unit of iron drakes within 12 inches of your hero gets plus one to hit until your next hero phase with missile attacks. Can you see where this is going? Nowhere fun for your opponent. Iron drakes already hit on threes. There are threes and threes. Both of these are, are 16 inch guns. So they're not hitting super far away, but getting that extra plus one to hit is really powerful. And it allows your handgunners to move and shoot and not uh, really be penalized for doing so, or at least not penalized as much, because they, have, they still have their plus one to hit when they don't move. So, for command traits, uh, our first one, we roll a d6 every hero phase and get an extra command point on a 4-up. Our next one, we re-roll 1s to hit for missile weapons, for units wholly within 12 inches of your general. And... Finally, friendly units can run and shoot while they're wholly within 12 inches of your general. Now, combined with your command ability, you're going to run up your hand gunners or iron drakes and then pop shots at your opponent. In addition to the double volley of artillery fire they got turn one. You're going to do a lot of damage to your opponent before they get anywhere near you. Now, that said, handgunners and artillery are not exactly melee heroes. So, you know, you're definitely going to have some problems in that particular area. But this is very, very strong heading towards, like, do all of the shooty stuff. So for our artifacts, uh, our first one is plus one to save, and if the hero does not have a mount, it is plus one to move. Um, and the fluff of that one, I forget the name of it, but it's basically power armor, which is kind of awesome. 
Uh, our next one gives one of our bearers missile weapons plus one damage. So that could be very good on certain heroes. And finally, you get one extra command point and plus one to hit on all of the missile weapons of the bearer. That one in particular, I think, would go great on a steam tank commander. So that is your hero steam tank. That's giving, you know, your long guns extra punch. So I think that is a really good possibility. Another thing that would go really, really well in this particular city is uh, your Lord Ordinator from Stormcast Eternals giving your artillery plus one to hit. So we can combine a lot of things together and get some really, really potent shooting. So for our spells, uh, our first one casts on a six you pick an enemy unit in 18 inches and it is minus one to hit the next we pick a terrain feature wholly within 18 inches and then all units within one inch of that terrain feature we roll a d6 they get a mortal wound on a five plus and it is treated as deadly until the next hero phase so basically it's blown up until the next hero phase. And finally, you pick an enemy unit within 15 inches, roll a d6 for each model within 15 inches in that unit, and each five up is a mortal wound. So that's similar to the Skaven Plague spell and the... Uh, I'm losing the name of it. What am I talking about? Zinch Gaunt Summoner's spell. And then our uh, battalion here is uh, a Cogsmith and two to four uh, rocket batteries or volley guns. And that lets them shoot twice in the first battle round. And I apologize. I was just giving you bad information. Um, the city itself does not give you um the extra shot what it gives you is one extra artillery in your list so in a 2000 point army ordinarily you would have four artillery gray water fastness allows you to have five and then our battalion that's the thing that is giving us that extra round of shooting in the first battle round and that is for all of your war machines within six inches of the Cogsmith. This is definitely going to be unfun to play against. I have a feeling it might be good. Considering that, like, shoot cast is good right now. And, you know, people have talked about various other things. I think we can put a relatively limited amount of points into shooting in this army something comparable to what stormcast is doing with a shoot cast list and then have a well-rounded robust army around that and be very strong i think because like stormcast is very elite and has a lot of very expensive units as a result here we have we can take a higher quantity of cheaper units gives us more flexibility um lets us take some other interesting choices so i think gray water fastness might be a better alternative to shoot cast maybe i'm not 100 percent sure but we will see once uh this book comes out and people start testing it our next city is the Phoenicium, once again in the realm of life. Now, everything about the Phoenicium is based around phoenixes. The Frostheart Phoenix and the Fire Phoenix. It 
everything in this really revolves around those, including the battalion. So this, the Phoenicium is really for people that own like four Phoenixes and want to play all of them. Um, that, those old mixed order lists, people were running with like Frostheart Phoenixes that were like indestructible. Um, this is the sort of, this is the city for that sort of list. So what does the Phoenicium do? Uh, if any of your units are destroyed, all of the rest of your units are plus one to hit and wound for the rest of that phase. Uh, and then all of your phoenixes get plus one to their wounds characteristic. So those are all tougher. Now, also, your fire phoenix, um, when it's slain on a four up, it just comes back with full wounds. So that is very strong. Our command ability, uh, if a phoenix is slain, uh, it can fight again before it's removed from play. So as you can see, very, very Phoenix centric. Our command traits, uh, plus one attack on melee weapons. If three or more models have been slain that turn, or, or actually I think it's units have been slain that turn. And three attacks if five or more have been slain that turn. The next is, uh, if your general is a wizard, it knows all spells from your spell lore. If it's not a wizard, it learns one spell and becomes a wizard. Uh, the really strong one here, I think, is uh, no battle shock tests wholly within 12 inches of your general. That is very good. For artifacts, uh, rend characteristic of better than minus one becomes zero which is really strong. Like the only rend you'll ever take is rend one. Everything else becomes a zero. Uh, next, your general, your hero with the artifact can run and charge. And finally, uh, all of your saving rolls of six heal a wound. That's really good. Especially on your phoenixes that you want to keep alive in doing things. So our spells, uh, on a six, enemy an enemy unit within 18 inches uh, gets half movement. Um, and we can compare that to one of the ones from uh, the Living City that basically does the six, same thing and it does D6 mortal wounds, but here it goes off on a six instead of a seven. So we're getting a little bit of a trade-off. Next up, casts on a five. Um, all enemy units within 18 inches of the caster are minus one bravery. And our final one on a six, you heal D3 wounds to all friendly units within 12 inches of the caster. That's really strong. And then our battalion is one to two frost phoenixes, one to two flame phoenixes, and all of your units heal one wound uh, within 12 inches of a phoenix. So the phoenix heals one wound a turn, and all of your other units within 12 inches of a phoenix heal one wound a turn. Now I'm not sure if these stack with each other. That's something that I was not clear on from the wording that I heard in other videos. But if they can, I mean, all of your phoenixes hanging out within 12 inches of each other and healing four every turn, plus you have a spell to heal, plus you're healing one per turn anyway, I believe. No, you have one extra wound characteristic. Uh, your phoenixes can fight when they die. It's it, it's just very strong. Getting rid of all of the, that nasty rend two and rend three, healing on saves of six. I feel like if you're running Phoenicium, 
you really are doing it to build around phoenixes and so that means if you're running phoenixium you basically take the battalion if you're not running phoenixes i don't see much of a reason to run phoenixium at all but that said um running phoenixes running four phoenixes is going to be really good i i don't see that as being a bad thing at all um and let me just check on points real quick so i have that up somewhere so our flame spire phoenix with a hero on it is 300 points our Frostheart Phoenix with a hero on it is 320 points. However, without the heroes, they are 220 for the Frostheart Phoenix and 200 for the Flamespire Phoenix. I don't know how much the hero is actually helping you. You might just want to run them just as the monster only with no hero and get the extra benefits from all the fun stuff in the battalion or maybe like one in one something like that i uh, i don't know i am not an elf player so i am really not that familiar with how you might want to run those our next city gets my award for worst one of all of these this is anvil guard it is in the realm of fire and i personally think this is a terrible city our first ability here is Illicit Dealings. We get to pick from three different possible abilities. We can get an extra artifact, an extra Drake Blood Curse, which is a mount trait for a Black Dragon, Charybdis, or Hydra, or get D3 additional command points at the start of the game. So our Drake Blood Curse, um, when you take an unsaved wound on a four up, it does a wound back. Uh, the next one, when the unit charges on a two up, it does D three mortal wounds to units within three inches. And our last two, it, the last one is minus two bravery to all enemy units within 12 inches. So none of those really excite me. And so... I think the extra Drake Blood Curse is not really uh, that exciting a thing to do. So we're really looking at getting an extra artifact or getting a D3 extra CP. If we're going for CP, we might as well go with Hammer Hall. Our command ability, we can basically sacrifice one model in a unit to have no battle shock holding within 18 inches of a hero. So, for our command traits, our first one is getting two illicit dealings instead of one. Our second one is plus one to hit and wound versus monsters. And the last one is, uh, if it, your general is a wizard, they know all of the spells from the spell lore. If they're not a wizard, they know a spell from the spell lore and become a wizard. For our artifacts, we get a... 5-up save against wounds and mortal wounds. We get uh, our second one. We choose one of the melee weapons on that hero. On a 6, it does D3 mortal wounds. And then on a 4-up, enemy units at the end of combat within 3 inches of that hero take D3 mortal wounds. None of that's really that exciting. <laughs> um, for our spells, an enemy unit within 18 inches is minus one to hit. And that goes off on a six. And that is exactly the same as a gray water fastness spell. Uh, next, we have uh, casts on a seven. An enemy unit within nine inches gets d6 mortal wounds. And finally, casting on an eight... An enemy unit within six inches of the caster have has its save reduced to zero until your next hero phase. That's a really interesting one. Um, 
It casts on an eight. So that is a challenge to get to, except when you have a sorceress on a black dragon. So if you're running a sorceress on a black dragon, keep a unit nearby to sacrifice guys to get plus two to cast, then this casts on a six, and then you can really like shred through enemy units. That said, that's like the best thing about this. Like this whole city, uh, it's just not that exciting. Our battalion is a fleet master, three corsairs, one to three scourge runner chariots, and zero to one charybdis. And it gives us plus one to wound versus monsters. I'm just going to come out and say I'm not sure what this city is trying to do. Um, it's an interesting, fluffy monster hunting thing, potentially. But that battalion ability is really weak. And I don't know about like the quality of those units necessarily. It's kind of fun that those are included in here. But overall, I am very nonplussed by Anvil Guard. I, I like it for fluff reasons. I dislike it for actual gameplay. So our next one is Hollow Heart. This is another one from the Realm of Fire, and this is our magic-oriented city. If you want to go bananas on magic, this is the city for you. So our first battle trait... All of our units ignore the effects of spells on a 5-up. That, that's really good. You, you get like a 5-up disregard enemy magic. Now, this used to be an ability that dwarves had on a lot of their uh, units. And here it is fantastic as well. Uh, just always having the ability to ignore enemy magic. Now, against certain armies, this is going to do absolutely nothing. But it's still strong. And then, the really big one here is all of our wizards cast an additional spell every turn. So all of your wizards get a lot better. And I will also say, going through the War Scrolls, all of the wizards are good. And our Collegiate Arcane Battle Mage got better, has better spells. Uh, Celestial Hurricanum and Luminarch of Heish also got better. Now, the Celestial Hurricanum still gives us a 10-inch aura of plus one to cast for Collegiate Arcane Wizards. So if you are running hard on Collegiate Arcane, then you're getting extra casting buffs and extra spells. Uh, we have a lore with six spells. All of our wizards in Collegiate Arcane have, um, well, apart from the Battle Mage, all have two spells on their War Scroll, as well as Arcane Bolt and Mystic Shield. All right. Then our command ability. Here is a really interesting one. You select a friendly wizard. You roll a d6. It takes that many mortal wounds. Then all of your wizards within 12 inches of that wizard get that roll added to their casting. So if you roll a three, you do D3 mortal wounds to the wizard, then everybody around him within 12 inches is plus three to cast. Now, let's just quickly do the math on how good this is. Because this is one that we like really need to like let sink in a little bit. We have... sort of like an initial reaction when we see this so because so many wizards are just like five wound 
schmucks on foot. So our initial reaction may be, well, that kind of sucks. I might kill my wizard. But then remember that we have the Luminarch of Heish. It has a six up save against uh, mortal wounds. We have both Phoenixes that have a four up save against mortal wounds. Then we have the Battle Mage on Griffin, Celestial Hurricanum, um, Sorceress on Black Dragon. Uh, and do we have anything else? Am I missing anything? I don't know. I may be missing something else. But we have all of these things. That these are monsters that are wizards. So they can take the D6 Mortal Wound. And then buff out all of these casters around them. And then that becomes a really big deal then when you go and look at your endless spells and how many things there are there that are really good that cast on like an eight. And oh, by the way, all of our endless spells now are in God mode all the time. So we can use this we got, you know, two casts on all of our wizards. We're buffing the crap out of our casting on our wizards. And we have all of these endless spells. We can cast a Bailwind Vortex. You know, it casts on a six with, you know, this buff off of this command ability. You're Pro you may be able to just auto cast a Bailwind Vortex. Like, not that hard. Uh, on a four up, you're, you're auto casting Bailwind Vortexes. So, that's going to increase your spell range by another six inches and give you uh, another spell cast every turn. We can set up a spell portal, and because we have the buffed version, the second side of it goes anywhere on the battlefield. So we can set up that other side right in front of our opponent's front lines or in key place. So we're always sticking spells directly in our opponent's face. And we have a lot of spells that can do a lot of damage. So we can be very offensive with our spells. We can easily power out a spell like, for example, like, Purple Sun, or Ravenax Gnashing Jaws, or the Pendulum. We just throw these high damage spells out there. So I think this is a very, very offensive, high-powered magic army. And when you start stacking off your buffs, you know, you have the Celestial Hurricanum giving you plus one to cast, and this command ability giving you plus D6 to cast. Like, now you're really, you're rivaling Nagash's power to cast spells. And it's with multiple wizards in your army. Like, for your opponent, that's going to be terrifying. Because you can just cast whatever you want, and there's not a lot they can do about it. And you have a lot of good spells at your disposal. So let's move on to the rest of this. I don't want to belabor the point too much about how good Hollow Hearts magic is, but it is bananas. And everybody needs to pay attention to this. I think this could be I mean, this could be a very strong army. And a lot of those wizards are cheap. You know, our regular battle mages are 90 points. Anyway, don't want to belabor the point too much. For command traits. Um, oh, units wholly within 18 inches of your general don't take battle shock. Our next one, uh, you roll a d6 every hero phase on a four up, you get a command point. And our last one is your plus three to dispel endless spells. Um, that's a very interesting one for your own use to. You know, dispel and reset up your own spells. For artifacts, 
Um, your bearer of the artifact is minus one to hit, or minus one to be hit, rather. So this is like the Griff Feather Charm. Um, at the end of combat, on a four up, units uh, within three inches of the hero get d3 mortal wounds. And the last one is, if it's a wizard, it knows all of the spells from the spell lore. If it's not a wizard, it knows one of the spells from the spell lore. Then we have our spell lore of six spells. The first one casts on a six. An enemy unit within 18 inches gets d3 mortal wounds. And then all enemy units within six inches of that unit on a four up get d3 mortal wounds. That's really good. That's one of those high damage spells that's going to, you know, you put that through a spell portal and you're going to, like, do a significant amount of damage to your opponent on the top of turn one. Next, casting on a six, a friendly unit within 18 inches heals d6 wounds. So after we buff all our casting, we can heal whatever wizard we just uh, sacrificed for casting. Next one on a six, an enemy unit within 12 inches. Um, we roll a d6 for each model within 12 inches. On a four up, it takes a mortal wound. So again, that's another one that is incredibly strong with spell portal. That's, a, you know, you set that in front of your opponent's front lines and you just go, and half of that unit's gone. And then half of that unit's gone. And half of that unit's gone. So, I mean, that's crazy strong. Our next one goes off on a six. Friendly units uh, within 18 inches. For every wound they take, they, uh, in melee, they bounce back a mortal wound on a four up. So... Once again, that's pretty strong. That makes your um, units that are kind of blocking for your wizards really uh, a little bit more prickly. Next, we have um, a spell that um, until your next hero phase, uh, this casts on a five. Your battle trait, where you ignore the effects of spells on a five up, uh, gets plus one, so it ignores spells on a four. And finally, casting on a six, a friendly unit within 18 inches is plus one to wound. Our battalion is just three to six wizards. Just wizards. Not any specific kind. Wizard of your choice. While they are within six inches of another wizard from the battalion, they're plus one to cast. Did I mention the Heart of Cannon gives you plus one to cast? And we cast an extra spell every turn. We have a command ability that we can do mortal wounds to one of our units to buff our casting. Good night, Nagash. Um, I'm excited to build around this. I don't know. I'm not sure of like how good this is. I do know that it will be wild and crazy. I think it is very possible that this could be a very, very strong list. Um, because a lot of your stuff that is a wizard is also powerful for other reasons. Like a Celestial Hurricanum is just good. A Luminarch of Heish is just good. So, um, you know, our Sorceress on Black Dragon is good. Oh, and by the way, our Sorceress and Sorceress on Black Dragon can sacrifice a guy to uh, get plus two to cast. And that stacks with all of this stuff. So, I mean, your Darkling Coven's magic is going to be off the charts your collegiate arcane magic is going to be off the charts. I mean, your phoenixes are like going to be always plus one to save. 
there's just a lot of different things here that we can do. Um, it, it's it's really cool. It's really good. Um, there's a very easy build around magic sort of concept here, and there's a lot of wizards, and all of our wizards are good. A lot of our wizards have synergy with each other. The spell lore for this city is also very good. We have access to powered up endless spells. Um, I, I think this one's got some wheels. This could be very interesting. Our final city is the Tempest's Eye. It is another one in the realm of fire. So our battle traits... Uh, first of all, we can include Karadran Overlords in the army. One in four units can be Karadran Overlords. Uh, the interesting note with that is that Arcanaut Company are generic battle line. So as far as I can tell, by the way all of these rules are written, a Tempest Eye army can take Arcanaut Company for battle line. Someone correct me in the comments if I'm wrong. But everything I'm reading says you can do that. Um, and that would be really good. Um, I mean, Arcanaut Company with Ether Chemists is probably the best thing about uh, Karadran Overlords. So being able to balance that out with an army that does other good stuff, and having like being able to do that with mixed order basically is pretty solid. Anyway, moving right along, in the first battle round, all of our units are plus three movement and plus one to save in the first battle round. And all of our units are always plus one to run. Our command ability for Tempest Psy. Um, you pick a unit within 12 inches of the hero using the command ability and that unit can run and shoot. So, just real quick, doing the math, we take a unit of Iron Drakes. They move four inches. They are plus one to run on their own. They are plus one to run with Tempest Psy. So, total plus two to run. Plus three to movement. So, they move seven, and they can run and shoot. So, they're moving... Like, at least 10 inches and have a 16-inch gun. So that means your Iron Drakes, a full squad of Iron Drakes, can unload a full unit's worth of shots into your opponent's front lines in any scenario at the top of turn one. I think Tempest Eye is really, really good for dwarves. It, that 3-inch movement in the first battle round is really what they need to like get off the line and really get there. And that extra one inch to run, it's just all like it, it gets the dwarves in the fight. So I think Tempest's eye is probably going to be the one that a lot of dwarf players are attracted to. Uh, Living city may also be good uh, because of the ambushing ability. Um, you know, you ambush a bunch of iron drakes, you know, nine inches away from the enemy, and then shoot the shit out of them. That seems pretty good. Um, same thing with hand gunners, by the way. That, that could be really, really good. So, our command traits uh, units are plus one to charge when they're wholly within uh, 12 inches of the general. Our second command trait, uh, units are plus one to wound uh, in the shooting phase while with, they're within 12 inches of the general. So, again, stacking that with our command ability to run and shoot, you can get plus one to wound, you know, your iron drakes are on threes and twos into your opponent's lines on turn one, uh, it, it's very good. Um, hand gunners, same sort of deal. 
All right, and then our last command trait, your general can run in charge, and it always fights at the start of combat. So, some good uh, activation war shenanigans. Uh, for artifacts, uh, we have one that all of your units wholly within 12 inches of your general don't take battle shock tests. Another one where... Uh, in each of your hero phases, you roll a d6 on a 4-up, you get a command point. And finally, your units wholly within 12 inches of the bearer of the artifact re-roll charges. Our spells. All of these go off on a 7. Uh, the first one, uh, a friendly unit wholly within uh, 12 inches of the caster gets plus one attack. Our next one, one enemy within 30 inches. 30 inches. You roll 6d6 and you, they take a mortal wound for each four up. And our final one uh, casts on a seven. You gain a command point. Which is a nice little one right there. Our battalion is a free guild general on a griffin. Three to six units of pistoliers or outriders. Zero to two grunstock gun haulers. And your, the units in the battalion can retreat and or charge in the same turn. So I'm not sure how valuable that is. Uh, I'm not really hot on that particular battalion. Um, a lot of these battalions are good. Uh, this is, you know, it, Anvil Guard, I think in general, is like the worst of the seven cities. Tempest Eye is probably one of the best of the cities, but I think it's also one of the worst um, battalions. Um, I think... This is going to be really good for dwarves. This is also going to be really good for armies that want to alpha strike. Um, and get, up, get across the board really quickly. Get charges in your opponent's face. Um, move up your shooting really quickly. And there's just a lot of options that you have here in Tempest Eye. So overall... Um, I really like the book a lot. There's so many things just like bouncing through my head right now of like, what am I going to do with my army? What are other people going to do with their armies? Um, I think Hammerhall and Tempest Eye are really like strong all around sort of cities that are going to play a little bit to different play styles. Um, Tempest Eye is going to be a little bit more alpha strikey and Hammer Hall is going to be a little bit more grindy. Uh, Living City is definitely um, all about, you know, the ambush and, um, you know, it, it, it feels to me very much like what wood elves played like in eighth edition it just kind of reminds me of that general idea we've got a lot of shenanigans gray water fastness obviously is just gun line army and your phoenicium building around your phoenixes um and you know frankly building a pretty strong phoenix oriented army and then hollow heart just being magic on 11 I mean, is 11 even high enough? I don't think 11 is enough for what Hollow Heart does. Um, the more that I kind of like read what this thing does, the more I'm like, this, this could be a thing. But so could any of these cities, really. It all depends on what you're running, what you want to do, um what faction you're playing with except anvil guard anvil guards trash um i will not accept anything except anvil guards trash feel free to leave me love down in the comments down below if you think anvil guard is not trash but 
I would take any of the other six cities over that any day of the week for any army. Um, I guess maybe if you're like, re if you really, really love your Dark Elves, that might be the place to be. But, I mean, why not Hammer Hall? Why not Tempest Eye? Why not Living City? Um, they, they're all very good. Why not Hollow Heart and make your uh, sorceresses ridiculous? Um, so, I'm, I'm really high on this book right now. I am a huge fan. Um, just real quick, maybe hitting some high points of things that I did not already mention in terms of War Scrolls. Um, I've been kind of making the assumption the whole way through here that you guys are familiar with what has been uh, discontinued and what is sticking around and is going to be in the book. Here's what you do. Go to the Games Workshop website. The uh, Age of Sigmar section now has a Cities of Sigmar filter. So you can see there what kits are in Cities of Sigmar. Everything else is being discontinued and will probably be in Legends as of the next General's Handbook. So uh, there are a lot of people that were like, oh, but what about this? Oh, maybe this will stick around and it's just not in the book. I would not bank on literally any of that whatsoever. I think if it's not in this book, it, it ain't surviving. Um, so basically, I, I hate to tell all the high elf players, but your high elves are basically dead apart from your phoenixes, anointed phoenix guard, and shadow blades, I believe. Um, so our War Scrolls, um, our Hellblaster Volley Gun and Hellstorm Rocket Battery both have merged profiles with their crew now, so we don't have to worry about that. They are, um, treated as a single model. They each have seven wounds and a four-up save. Um... Hellblaster Volleygun does basically exactly what it used to do. Um, it hasn't really changed. The rocket battery has is basically the same, except the rocket damage now is D3 instead of D6, and its points went down a lot. Um, also, now you don't have the doesn't require line of sight rule in here so you need line of sight with your rocket batteries now which is not that big of a deal uh gyro bombers got a bit of an upgrade their uh grudge buster bombs detonate on a two up instead of a four up now so those are going to be doing wounds most of the time uh gyro bombers now a lot better than they used to be uh, same thing with the guild bombs on the gyrocopter. The battle mages spells got a rework. So uh, without going too in-depth on them, uh, Mystifying Miasma is uh, pick an enemy unit within 18 inches and it's minus two to charge. Um, Pall of Doom... Uh, is minus two bravery. Fa's protection uh, is a, a unit is minus one to be hit. Uh, shield of thorns. Uh, pick a friendly unit until your next hero phase. Enemy units that finish a charge within three inches suffer D three mortal wounds. Uh, wild form is plus one. I'm sorry, it's plus two to run in charge rolls. Uh, so wild form is really good. Um, I think if you want to like alpha strike units, you definitely want to take a, a battle mage with wild form. 
because that plus two is a big deal. Plus the one that's probably on its war scroll already. Um, you know, plus all the other things that you can do. You know, there's just so many options. Um, the Luminarch's gun got reworked. So when it shoots, uh, you use in it has one of the sea below profiles. Uh, so the searing beam of light, uh, you draw a, an imaginary line to a point 30 inches away. You roll a D6 for every unit that is a, along that line. And on a two up, it does D3 mortal wounds. So that is very, very good. Um, Celestial Hurricanum, the Storm of Shimtech got streamlined. Now you just roll 3d6 and for each two up the unit selected suffers d3 mortal wounds. Uh, we still have Common of Cassandora. Uh, let's see what else we have. Uh, our battle mage on Griffin is still not that exciting. Out of Free Guild, uh, unfortunately, our Free Guild general, our regular Free Guild general, can no longer be mounted on a horse. He only has one attack profile. That kind of sucks. His command ability got changed from a unit within 15 inches to a unit wholly within 18 inches. So probably not that big of a change on like what it effectively does. Our free guild general on Griffin. Um, it doesn't do the plus two bravery on his command ability anymore. Everything else is basically the same. Our free guild guard uh, they're still plus one to hit for 10 or more models, plus two to hit for 20 or more models. It does not go beyond that anymore, though. You used to be able to stack up lots and lots of those bonuses. So, I mean, back in the early days of Age of Sigmar, you could make them auto-hit, which is not a thing anymore. Ones always fail. But in addition it was just nice to have like when you ran up against like a minus one to hit thing it if you had a block of 40 it, you would just kind of ignore it but now it will matter um our sword and shield guys are just a flat plus one to save now our spears are plus one to hit when they get charged and our halberds are three up to wound instead of four up to wound. So that makes them a much more attractive option than they used to be. Uh, great swords became greater. Make great swords great again. Um, so now their profile is two attacks, three up, three up, rend one, one damage. If they have a free guild hero within 18 inches of them, they get plus one to hit. So they go to twos and threes. And all of their hits of six do a mortal wound in addition to any normal damage. So that's pretty good. Uh, speaking of that general sort of ability, uh, executioners got reduced from two mortal wounds to one. So they got nerfed. Um, now great swords are basically the same thing as executioners, which is kind of cool. Um, hand gunners are now four to hit, three to wound. And instead of having their not moving and their massed ranks uh, be two separate plus ones to hit, it's that if you have 10 or more models and you haven't moved, then you get plus one to hit. And they just have a plus one to hit all the time compared to their old uh, War Scroll. Uh, the big thing here is that their plus one to hit triggers at 10 models instead of the 20 models that it used to trigger on. So it's like a strong unit of handgunners now is definitely like 20. And you don't need to go to the crazy 30 that you used to to like always be on threes and threes. 
um, and they still have their stand and shoot ability. Crossbows lost their stand and shoot, but they got their range extended to 24 inches, and they get double shots um, similarly to handgunners um, at 10 or more models and not moving instead of 20. Uh, Pistoliers got a bit of a rework. They can shoot uh, after they charge. So they get, if they charge, they get two rounds of shooting and then they get melee. Um, Outriders, they can, let's see. They no longer have a plus one to hit if they don't move, but they get plus one attacks if they are not within three inches of enemy units. So they're, instead of D3 shots each, now they're at D3 plus one shots each. Um, and they can run and or retreat and still shoot later in the same turn. So I, I feel like that's an ability that I really wanted Outriders to have for a long time, and now they do, and I'm super psyched about Outriders. Uh, I feel like I might pick up more of them, because I only have five for some reason. Probably because they've been garbage for a long time. Uh, in our Demigriff Knights, the main thing to note is... Uh, are we're on threes to hit fours to wound no rend one damage and then when we charge it goes to rend two two damage and our beacon talons is on threes and threes with rend one and i believe it used to be d3 mortal wounds for wounds of six and now it is one mortal wound for hits of six so, uh, I think it's, it's just a better ability, like, in terms of, like, rules right-wise, uh, on the Demigriffs now. It's more consistent with how other things work. Um, let's just take a quick look at points. Um, you know, I hate to be free guild-centric, but that really is the army that I'm most concerned with. And just kind of a note for everybody is that it seems like a lot of this is, like, these cities in large part were built around Free Guild. And you have, like, Phoenicium that was built around Phoenixes. And Greywater Fastness, that was built around Ironweld Arsenal. And then uh, Hallowheart was built around Wizards, but most of your Wizards are Collegiate Arcane. So, in general, like, this book is a big love letter to the Empire of olden days. Um, you know, for newer players, everything that's in Freegeld, Ironweld Arsenal, and uh, Collegiate Arcane used to all be in one army. Um, apart from the Cogsmith and Gyrocopters and Gyrobombers. Um, so... This feels like Free Guild and Friends more than, uh, you know, kind of like this multi-faction book to me personally. Um, although if you were a Dark Elf player, this book is very good for you. Uh, and I think if you were a Wood Elf player, this book was very good to you. If uh, you were a High Elf player, Games Workshop just told you to go fuck yourself. So... Um, Anyway, looking at points, uh, the Assassin is 80 points, which is pretty cool. Fleetmaster went up to 60 because he's a little bit more valuable now. <laughs> and it's kind of silly to have a 40-point hero. Um, let's see. Battle Mages are 90 points. Our uh, Celestial Hurricanum with a Battle Mage is 280. And our Luminarch with a Battle Mage is 270. Now we can take both of those without the Battle Mage for 220 and 210, respectively. So those are... Uh, you can take them for pretty cheap now. 
let's see what else we got here. Cogsmith is down to 60 points. So he is really easy to slide into an army. He's really just there to buff your artillery anyway. And be part of a battalion. Kind of like making a battalion happen. So for generic battle line options, we have Bleak Swords, Dark Shards, Dread Spears, Eternal Guard, Free Guild Crossbows, Free Guild Guard, Free Guild Handgunners, Iron Breakers, and Long Beards. And then everybody else is some sort of conditional battle line. Uh, other interesting points of note... Uh, great swords are up to 160 and 240 for their massive regiment. Demigriffs are up to 180. Flagellants, for some reason, are still here. Um, just FYI, their scroll really didn't change. And without the rest of um, the Devoted of Sigmar buffing them, like they're pretty bad. I don't know why they're still here. I really don't get it at all. Anyway, um, most of our free guild points, other than that, didn't change. Our free guild general on Griffin went to 320. Although it's not that surprising because in the context of the army, he's a lot better than he used to be. Um, like that extra plus one to run in charge is a big deal. He, that That's going to get you there a lot of the time. So... Um, Gyro Bombers, 80 points. Gyrocopters down to 70. Uh, Shadow Warriors are 110, which makes them a very interesting option because they can just pop up uh, anywhere, anytime, basically. Uh, you know, at the end of any of your movement phases, like well, at the start of the game, you can set them up off the table and have them come on. Uh, during your movement phase anywhere on the battlefield more than nine inches away from enemy models. So I think those are going to be really good for um, like a, a good screening unit and things like that. Um, good like pop up and take a few shots, a good distraction. Uh, they definitely have a lot of utility and at 110 points for 10 of them, I think that's a pretty fair price. Let's see if anything else here really stands out to me. Uh, Steam Tank without uh, the hero is only 200 points. So that is very cheap. It's uh, almost cheap enough to run, I think. Um, and it's just super cool to take him with a hero. Like, that's just a fun, fluffy thing to do. Um... Let's see. I know I'm kind of like trailing off at the end of this here. Uh, basically, all of our cavalry have that like Ren 2 Lance situation. Anybody that has a Lance uh, basically does that. Um, other than that, uh, I'm not really familiar enough with a lot of the elf factions or the dwarves even to really... Uh, comment too much on the war scroll changes there but it's i feel like this is really strong like this is a really good book and i don't think it is like broken good but it has a lot of things in it that are going to play around in the space where some competitive armies live you know, those armies that want to jump across the board and alpha strike you, you know, you can have a lot of units set up in ambush. You can have uh, handgunners lined up to stand and shoot against them. Uh, you have a lot of stuff that prevents battle shock. You have really strong magic to deal with, um, you know, Nagash and other heavy casting armies. Uh, if you... Uh, take Hollow Heart. Um, I think Tempest Eye really makes dwarves like really viable. Like, whereas before your dispossessed were just like the most trash of trash units, um, they were like like the worst faction probably. 
and now I think like their profiles fit what they can do with that extra three inch move and plus one save in the first battle round in Tempest Eye, I think they're really viable and being able to mix in courage and overlords and fire slayers. Um, you can run, I think a really good mixed dwarf army and have it really be viable and have it be good, which I'm sure a lot of dwarf players are going to be really happy about. Uh, the, Phoenix order soup list, I think, is kind of still there. Um, one thing that I just realized that is not here in our allies list at all is um, Seraphon. So we just, I guess, can't ally with Seraphon at all. Which basically nobody can. So, but we do get to take, uh, you know, all of the other. Uh, order factions as allies. Whoa. I just uh, whacked the table and made everything go wonky for a second there. Well, I am losing my voice because I've been talking for almost two hours. I am very happy with this book. I need to do more analysis and I will be doing lots more videos on it. But I think I'm going to call it the end for now. I'm excited. Get hyped. It's coming next week. And I think it's going to be hitting tournament tables very soon. So I'll talk to you all later.